Okay, so now we'll talk about the management of distal humerus fractures, fixation versus replacement. So uh, we'll talk again about anatomy of classification, principles of management, so what implants we use, what are some of the techniques we use to get there, and what are some of the results. So uh, the distal humeral anatomy is very unique and very important in terms of how we fix these and, and how the fractures happen and why patients generally do relatively poorly with complicated fractures because the articular segment of the distal humerus, everything you see in red, is not really supported by a lot of bone except for on the medial and the lateral columns. So there's this giant area of the trochlea and capitellum which is all articular. So when you fracture through that area, reconstructing that with plates and screws usually have to be done through either the lateral or medial side, which makes um, dealing with these fractures complicated, especially when they split through the middle and they have central comminution. So the important parts about the supracondylar columns are in that the medial side, there's really not a lot of cartilage on this side. This is all ligament and all muscle. Whereas on the lateral side, the posterior aspect has no cartilage on it, but the anterior side is the capitellum. So when we start thinking about how we fix these, a lot of these anatomic plates are designed around the anatomy of the distal humerus. So the majority of distal humerus fractures are largely extra-articular, but that's followed very closely by complete articular fractures where the articular surface is not connected to the shaft by any means. And then some fractures, a smattering, are these partial articular fractures where either part of the column will be disrupted or you'll have like a coronal shear fracture. These are a little bit, uh, these are treated a little bit more differently. Now, the C fractures, uh, about 68% of those fractures are in elderly patients. So the majority of these complicated fractures, the C type fractures, are in patients over the age of 65. So uh, that's when we'll talk a little bit about arthroplasty and how that comes into play. So how do we image these? When patients come in, obviously AP and lateral radiographs, traction views are really helpful. Um, as you can see here, um, these, this is a view of someone in the emergency room without traction, and then on the right, you can really glean a lot of that fracture when you put the patient into just a little bit of traction. Um, you can get a sense for the articular segments, how they're rotated, where the comminution is on the medial column, what's going on with the lateral column, much more than you can with just a straight AP view without anybody holding on to it. Um, CT scan, of course, is helpful in most cases. Um, sometimes, though, when a patient's a polytrauma and their arm is sitting in rotation, the, sorry, excuse me, the, um, the orientation of the CT scan makes things a little bit more complicated. So, of course, three-dimensional CT is helpful, but you don't always get a lot of the minutia of the fracture as well as you do with just a good traction view. It's important to figure out whether these are open or closed fractures. The most commonly missed open fractures I see are patients that come in with complicated distal humerus fractures, and then the ER doctor will call and say, hey, there's a small scratch over the one aspect of their elbow, and almost always that's an open fracture. So you really have to keep a very close eye on what their skin looks like. Um, I usually, unfortunately, have learned to trust no one. I take the splint down, I take a look at their skin, make sure it's not open because that will dictate um, how we treat it. So if you're an, an emergency room physician or a PA or someone who tends to evaluate these on the front line, it's important to do a neurovascular exam. It's important to check their skin because oftentimes they will have small poke holes that go unrecognized. And we can't forget about non-op non treatment. So a lot of patients can be quite functional if we treat them with what we call a bag of bones treatment. So limited goals, we educate patients on their expectations. And if you look at this patient here, they had a pretty complicated distal humerus fracture which went on to a relative malunion, but their function I would argue is probably better than the majority of patients who would have an open reduction internal fixation. So we really can't forget about the role of non-surgical treatment. Even though largely the, the, the teaching is that these should be treated surgically, I think some patients in the studies would support this, that the union rate's pretty good, and you can have 70% excellent, good or excellent outcomes. So really let's not forget about that. Um, but how do we treat them surgically? Um, so the principles of surgical management, there's a couple controversies, and we'll talk about that. How do we deal with the ulnar nerve? How do we manage the triceps? Should we reconstruct and fix it? How should we do that with plates, with headless screws? And is there a role for a replacement, either a distal humerus replacement, which is what you see here, or a total elbow replacement, which you see on the right? So the continuum of care, this is how I like to think about complicated distal humerus fractures. For the younger patients, almost all of them get some form of open reduction internal fixation, unless it's an extreme situation, in which case I'll show you an example of a patient who got a distal humeral replacement, which is uncommon. And then once they hit the age of around mid-60s to 70s, we start considering the role of total elbow arthroplasty, and there's some evidence to suggest that that can be helpful.
So the first controversy in how we de deal with these is, well, how do you manage the ulnar nerve? So a lot of people ask, well, do you transpose the ulnar nerve? Do you just decompress it and leave it? Do you not decompress it at all? So I always identify the nerve when I do these operations. And then we consider a transposition versus decompression. There's some evidence, or there actually is a lot of evidence, I should say, that uh, with people who have preoperative nerve dysfunction, if they come in, oftentimes they'll complain of numbness in their little finger, their ring finger. They always get a transposition, and, a de and, and more so than a decompression. There's some at level two evidence to support that. If their nerve's intact and they have no nerve symptoms, I think it's dealer's choice. A lot of hand and upper extremity surgeons tend to transpose the nerve because they don't want to deal with it, and we see complications from that. And I think just in general, a lot of trauma surgeons leave it, but there's no right answer one way or the other. So manage it as you will if they don't have preoperative symptoms. How do we see? So if you look at this, this rendering on the right, when you do a paratricipital approach is where you would split the tricep, you can see everything in, in yellow. When you do an electron on osteotomy or you move the tricep somehow, then you could see everything in blue. And so your exposure gets better as things, as, you, as things get more intense in terms of how you manage the tricep, and a lot of it depends on what type of fracture you have. So we have to be very careful in terms of how we deal with the tricep, either with an electron on osteotomy, tricep reflecting approach. There's all these different ways we manage the tricep. And how does that influence our strength and, and function postoperative? And I'll, and I'll argue, based on some systematic reviews, that whatever you do, you should be able to see what you're doing, do it well, and however you manage the triceps, patients will largely do okay. So there, you go to meetings sometimes and people are like, I never do an electron osteotomy, I never manage the tricep. I think that's crazy, personally. I tend to take the alternative approach. I think doing an osteotomy takes 10 minutes and you can see everything and you never have to worry about the joint. So I almost always osteotomize if there's any question in my mind if it's necessary. But it's, people are very passionate one way or the other. The good news is, whatever you choose to do, it's supported by the literature. Pretty much everything you want to do to see the distal humerus um, has good outcomes and there's obviously complications that can happen. But largely, if you do a meticulous job on your closure, largely patients will do okay. Um, so I, I tend to do what's called a progressive approach. So when I'm doing these fractures, I'll do a tricep sparing approach. So I'll kind of split the medial and lateral heads of the triceps, and I'll come down onto the humerus and basically see what I can see from the medial lateral columns. And if I'm running into any trouble, um, I'll do an electron on osteotomy. So these are my kind of dissection lines. I'll manage the ulnar nerve. And as we go, sometimes you end up needing to do an osteotomy uh, just to see better. When I do the osteotomy, I do a chevron osteotomy, and what I typically will use is a 6.5 millimeter partially threaded cannulated screw, and I'll take a microsagittal saw, and Jesse Jupiter taught me this trick. You could take a little four by eight sponge and sneak it into the base of the olecranon and windshield wiper it to find the bare area, and that's usually where you'll do your osteotomy onto. I, ref I usually pre-drill it, so then once the osteotomy is ready to close, I'll actually close it with a washer, and I'll do a tension band suture with uh, some sort of high tensile suture to close it and not use a tension band wire just because I think that tends to irritate. Um, I've had zero non-unions of electron and osteotomies, and I think if you close it under compression with a large washer and a large bore screw, these tend to do extremely well. And you have to do it at the bare area. I've seen patients that come in that have osteotomies through the coronoid, and you have to be very careful where you osteotomize the electron. On. So again, it's you, you trace down the triceps, you find the bare area, and you osteotomize there. And you can really see everything. Once you do that, I mean, the exposure is incredible. So if you're really worried about a younger patient and you want that, that congruent triangle to be perfect, I usually like to see more. So how do we treat this? So, so I like to restore the triangle. I want stable articular fixation. I want to restore the normal alignment, both on the coronal and the axial plane. And I want early range of motion. That's, the most, that's why we fix these. We want to move them quickly. So back in the day before lock plate fixation, we used to have all these fancy contracts, and a lot of them failed, unfortunately. Uh, they would go into non-union. You'd have these biomechanical studies that would show that basically the fixation was poor, and, and, and largely these would turn into disasters because you couldn't compress, and you'd have windshield wipering through some of the, the implants. Um, there's a lot of debate whether or not we should be doing 180 degree plating or, or perpendicular plating, and I'll tell you that largely there's really no distinct difference in biomechanical studies as to whether you do a medial and lateral plate or a medial and posterior lateral plate, as long as they're locking plates. So if you're using locking plates medially, locking plates with some sort of form laterally, you're doing okay. So the biomechanical studies really show there's no difference. Maybe with perpendicular plating, they have a slightly higher non-union rate in some of the studies, but more or less do what you feel comfortable doing, do what your implant dictates, and do what the fracture dis dictates. Use a lot of K-wires. So whenever I'm doing a provisional articular fixation, I get in there, I osteotomize the, 
the electron on, and I, I start throwing in K wires like, um, you know, like they're going out of style. And, and you'll see that you can put six, seven, eight K wires, make sure the articular reduction is perfect, and make sure that you're not boxing yourself out once you start putting the plates on, and then work from there. So even the most complicated distal humerus fractures, you can see you can reconstruct them sometimes uh, with a mini fragment plate, or even you can bury small K wires into the joint. But largely, the most important thing to get is an articular surface that restores the anatomy of the, of the humerus, and secondarily, that touches the medial and lateral columns. So it's really, really important to get proximal screws and to actually compress the fracture fragments onto one another. So you need support from the humerus that somehow touches the articular surface and compress those because non-unions, as you saw in that picture before, that's a pretty disastrous complication and those are very difficult to manage. So I like to get some distal articular fixation. I like to get support up the columns. Um, and you really want to have a lot of fixation coming from medial and lateral. So again, provisional articular fixation, however way you want to do it, you want to have some sort of medial, some sort of lateral, medial and lateral plates, and then you want to get compression through the supracondylar region. And sometimes if you have comminuted fractures and the olecranon fossa is, compre is uh, comminuted, you can actually take a burr and actually bore out a new olecranon fossa when you compress these fractures. So they're pretty complicated to manage, of course. Um, and largely the really depressing thing is no matter how good of a job you do, um, the satisfaction rates, they're never perfect. You can have a perfect looking x-ray and you might think this function, this function is going to be wonderful and the patient does about 80%. Um, and that's, that's generally true throughout every study that you'll read. People generally do well, but they're certainly not perfect. Jesse Jupiter studied these and looked at 20% on satisfactory outcomes, even recent studies in 2003. And I mean, this comes up all into 2019. Generally people do well and about 20% of them don't do well. Um, so no matter how well you do, you have to counsel your patients when you see something like this. There's a good chance that you might get stiff. And as long as it heals with a little bit of stiffness, it's a slam dunk. So what are some of the complications? Uh, stiffness, hardware prominence, non-union, malunion. We can have heterotopic ossification. That's br really bad. And uh, before the advent of lock plating, we used to see things a lot more like this, where things would just kind of fall apart. We'd have nerve injuries, et cetera. Um, so, there's a study that came out recently that looked at how patients do if they're over the age of 60 to 70, and generally they found that with open reduction internal fixation you could do well, um, but there's this new movement where we tend to replace some of these fractures. So elbow arthroplasty can be done for unreconstructable distal humerus fractures. Um, we can, uh, it's a non-anatomic, of course, solution um, that's wrought with some problems, but it's, it does allow early functional movement. And for some patients, especially elderly, more infirm patients, a distal humeral, uh, excuse me, a um, elbow replacement can work well, but in patients who are a little bit younger who don't want restrictions, this is an off-label technique, uh, but you can actually do a distal humeral hemiarthroplasty. So the indications for those generally are patients who are elderly, people with poor bone stock, high levels of comminution, and they're able to be compliant. So when I tell a patient if they're about to get an elbow replacement, I tell them I don't want them lifting anything over 10 pounds ever. Um, a lot of them freak out, and then that's the case where you pull back and you say, maybe we shouldn't be doing an elbow replacement on you, but if they don't mind that, and they want earlier function, and they want a more reliable result, and they don't mind complying with the 10-pound weightlifting restriction. By the way, that's an arbitrary thing that was, um, Bernie Mori um, talks about 5 to 10 pounds as an arbitrary number that we use for patients. There's really no literature to support it. Um, but uh, that's generally what I would tell patients. And an open fracture, that's not a contraindication to do an elbow replacement, by the way. The theoretical benefits, early mobilization, no post-traumatic arthritis, you don't have to worry about anything healing. It's actually cheaper, believe it or not, it's faster, and you can increase your risk, your functional mobility time. So where are we now? These are the, some old implants. Um, this is the, one of the Sorby elbows. These are unlinked implants, but nowadays we have a coupled linking mechanism that has 15 degrees of varus and valgus play, and this tends to work very well. This is the old Coonrad Mori implant. Some of them are a lot more complicated. This is the Tournier Latitude, um, but generally they're semi-constrained implants uh, that sometimes are linkable, but most patients, most people would agree that semi-constrained implants uh, tend to be the best, mostly because biomechanically they tend to work. There's a lot of um, things about them that are important. They all have to have an anterior phalange. They have to have a little bit of sloppy hinge because that, that restores elbow anatomy nicely. Now, there's a couple of studies that support it. Now, this original study in 97 looked at patients who had severe fractures of the distal humerus, and a lot of them had rheumatoid arthritis, and generally they did pretty well. And finally, we came up with a randomized study um, that was done in 2008 by Mark McKee, and he actually just recently, um, by Mike McKee, he just recently came out with a follow-up study that they randomized 40 patients to a total elbow versus open reduction internal fixation, and generally the total elbow 
Lobos did very well, and at 10 years, they found that patients did really, really well. So I'm just going to skip ahead. This was a study that was reduced, that was just came out last month, that looked at seven to 12 year follow up on these patients, and they really the complications, the implant survival, late term function were all pretty much the same in total elbows. So the revise, the revision rates were pretty low. But the one thing that was true is the patients who had total elbows as opposed to open reduction internal fixation had much better function much quicker. So if you're worried about the longevity of the implant, if the patient's a little younger, uh, seven to 12 year follow-up may support total elbow, but we have to be careful because when these things uh, don't do well, you can have disastrous complications. And when, when a total elbow loosens and when you have ballooning and problems throughout the total elbow, you can get bushing wear, mechanical fra failure, periprosthetic fracture, tricep insufficiency, and these are much harder to manage than stiffness and arthritis. Um, so this is just a little ploy for elbow hemiarthroplasty. It can work very well in younger patients with highly comminuted fractures. Um, this was an example of a patient I saw recently. She's 73. Uh, she came in with a severely comminuted distal humerus fracture and was recommended total elbow arthroplasty. And, I, and uh, she likes to ride horses, and she has a farm and does a lot of manual labor. And uh, so we ended up deciding to do an elbow hemiarthroplasty, which is um, basically a partial replacement of the distal humerus. And this was her one-year outcome and follow-up. So, so there's a role for this, I think, and it's emerging, and there's a lot of studies that are supporting this uh, practice for the select patient who are sort of not quite elderly and not quite infirm, but want really good functional use of their arm and don't want to be limited long term. Uh, so in conclusion, um, get a look at what you're doing when you're fixing these or replacing them. In terms of fixing them, you know, locked plating is very important. All things being equal, I would always rather fix it than replace it if possible, but you can replace unreconstructable fractures and generally they do okay. And overall, you should let the evidence speak as to how, which way you choose and be very frank with your patients that one way or another, these uh, generally are very hard fractures to manage in the long term and uh, they can develop quite a bit of contracture and stiffness. Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.